Hi, welcome to this week's Compound Your Knowledge video. Uh, today we're going to go over four papers that were covered on our website during the previous week. Uh, the first paper, which we're going to do a little bit deeper dive into, is Factor Momentum Everywhere by Taryn Gupta and Brian Kelly of AQR. Um, so the whole idea of this paper is to examine whether or not uh, momentum exists across uh, or within the factors. So when we talk about factors, just to remind everyone, we're going to be looking at like long short factors. So for example, the value factor would be long value stocks, short growth stocks. Similarly, uh, there's going to be momentum factors, profitability, uh, volatility, etc. So mainly they focus on the well-known factors and kind of just variations of the way that they're built. So there's going to be 59 factors that are examined in this paper. And the natural question is whether or not there's momentum you know, within or across this set of 59 factors. So uh, when I first read the title, Factor Momentum Everywhere, the first thing I thought of was I know Research Affiliates had a paper uh, that I read a couple of months ago talking about factor momentum. And in that paper, they look at what's called cross-sectional factor momentum. So uh, the example would be in the 59 factors, what they would do is go long the factors that have done the best, go short the ones that have done the worst, when you compare all of them uh, at a point in time, at a cross-section. How this paper is different is it's going to actually look at the time series momentum of the individual factors themselves. And so what's time series relative to cross-section? Well, cross-section, as I mentioned, is if you had 10 factors, and let's just say uh, you would rank them over their past one month or 12 month returns, and you would go along the top five, go short the, the bottom five. That's cross-sectional momentum. Time series is going to look at each individual factor's return over some look back period. So we're gonna compare the return of factor A to its own previous returns. It's not compared to any other factors. And so for time series momentum, what will happen is uh, of our 10 factors, let's say seven of them were positive and three of them were negative. In this case, we would be long seven factors, short three factors. Okay, so just to differentiate the two. Um, the paper will look at cross-sectional, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later, but the main results of this paper are showing that within the factor complex, uh, time series momentum appears to exist, right? Um, so they show this really in Exhibit 2 of their paper, where they look at the first order autoregressive component for each factor, and they find that it's positive. Um, and then what happens if you actually apply the time series momentum rule to each factor and then across the combination of them. And so this is shown in exhibit three of the paper. And in exhibit three, all they're doing is they're taking uh, each factor's returns and using a time series momentum rule. So basically if last month's return was positive, we are going to go long that factor. Uh, if it's negative, we're going to short that factor, right? And what you find is you know, pretty positive results. And the uh, combination of all of these has very high alpha uh, panel A, as well as a very high sharp ratio in panel B. Um, so going back to what I was talking about earlier, uh, time series and cross-sectional momentum, right? Um, they actually do examine this in the paper, whereby they say, okay, how do time series momentum cross factors and cross sectional momentum correlate and does one kind of explain the other. Uh, so what they find is they find that there's a very high correlation. It's 0.9 or higher generally. Um, and then secondarily, what they examine in exhibit eight of this paper is how does time series momentum relate to other momentum results, right? Such as like uh, 212, the UMD momentum, industry momentum, as well as the cross-sectional momentum factor that I mentioned. So basically going long short, the momentum factors uh, that have done the best relative to each other. Uh, what you find, interestingly enough, is that the time series momentum factor results, uh, based on varying look back, still survives kind of standard momentum as well as industry momentum. And then if you look on the far right, it compares time series momentum against the cross-sectional momentum factor exposure. 
And what you see is positive alphas. Whereas when we go to panel B, right, the cross-sectional momentum exposure, we see that sometimes, uh, especially for like 212, the cross-sectional momentum is pretty much explained or the alpha goes away by the just standard UMB stock momentum strategy. And then when we go to the far right, we see that there's negative alphas when we regress the cross-sectional momentum factor on the time series momentum factor. Uh, and what that kind of explains is that although these two are related, uh, it appears basically that the time series momentum factor is more powerful than the cross-sectional momentum factor. So this paper is very interesting. A uh, few other neat results from the paper, at least from my perspective. Uh, first was uh, when they built like ex post tangency portfolios. Uh, and this was in exhibit 12 of the paper, uh, looking at like value momentum and then this time series factor momentum. You actually do see positive loadings on both value momentum and the time series factor momentum portfolio, kind of indicating these could probably all be used in combination with each other. Um, and then the second one, uh, which I think is very interesting, uh, is this time series momentum factor um, has a different relationship than standard price momentum. Right, and what do I mean by that? Well, so standard price momentum at the short term, like one month, as well as long term, like three to five years, shows reversal patterns, right? Whereby previous losers uh, do well, previous winners do poorly. Um, and then intermediate momentum has continuation. However, this time series factor momentum model, uh, or uh, factor, I guess we could call it, uh, actually has continuation for both short term, intermediate term, and long term. Uh, so definitely a different result than just your standard price momentum factor. And so I highly recommend everyone uh, read that paper by AQR. So let's move on to the second article, uh, The Redeath of Value or Deja Vu All Over by Larry Swedra. And Larry starts off this article uh, by highlighting an interesting anecdote that uh, I was actually unfamiliar with. Uh, and it was in 1979 by Business Week, kind of talking about how equities had underperformed uh, over that previous 10, 12 year period. Uh, and the whole, uh, there was a quote in the article saying, you know, only the elderly uh, basically who are unable to adapt are sticking with equities. Of course, equities went on to go on to a long epic run. Uh, so the idea of this article, the main idea is, you know, value investing recently, past, let's say, 10 years-ish, has underperformed, right? Um, and so Larry goes on and talks about a lot of things about value factor uh, and its recent performance. So I highly recommend everyone read this article, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about three of the topics that he discusses. So first is, you know, this kind of has happened before. So he looked at the 1994 to 1999 period, a six-year period. Right, where the S&P returned in aggregate total 256%, whereas large value returned you know, 148%. Um, and you know that was the infamous Warren Buffett's losing his magic touch. Uh, and the subsequent years, 2000 2007, you know, the S&P returned 14% and large value returned 73%, right? So first off, you know, this has happened before. Uh, factor uh, premiums are time varying. That's been shown in multiple articles. Um, so, you know, investors can either decide, you know, how much they want to expose themselves to this factor uh, in their portfolio. Uh, the second one, though, uh, is talking about overcrowding. Uh, and he talks about a quote from the characteristic of mutual funds. Where are the value funds? And this was a neat paper. We've covered it on our post, uh, our blog as well. Kind of showing that in general, actually, most mutual funds don't really have allocations towards the value factor, um, which is just an interesting artifact uh, when you look at the data. Is that very few people or funds are actually allocating towards said factor that they claim to be uh, trying to achieve, right? Uh, the third is valuation spreads. And so a uh, question could be, you know, well, maybe a lot of people love value investing. And, you know, now that we know about it after the Fama French article, and there's been, you know, 20, 30 years of articles following up on that, or 25 years of 
uh, articles following up on value. Maybe people are just piling into value and the spreads, you know, like PE, price to book, of uh, value stock relative to growth stocks may have compressed. Uh, and what Larry shows in this article is that they actually haven't. Um, and depending on how you, do, you measure it, uh, Larry cites a couple sources, uh, you know, they're either similar to uh, where they were uh, back in 1994, or if anything else, we're in, you know, uh, the, he cites an APR study where we're in the 87th or like 97th percentile for value. Um, meaning that value stocks currently are actually very cheap uh, according to that, to that site. Um, some other things that Larry mentions in this paper, uh, an article, and I do recommend everyone read it. Uh, one is looking at like stocks with negative cash flows. Uh, so meet need study again by AQR showing, you know, like last year and even year to date, uh, uh, stocks with negative cash flows had outperformed stocks with positive cash flows. This also happened back in 1999. So uh, doesn't really happen that often, uh, but appears to be happening recently. Uh, second deals with inflation and the value premium. So that's, I, I'm just gonna uh, push it back to the article. I, you should read that. Um, but basically in you know higher inflation periods, uh, value may do better. And second, uh, or the last, sorry, third, the last uh, point that Larry talks about in addition to the other ones is talking about just valuations. Um, valuations on the stock market. So. This is a nice article by Larry uh, that highlights a lot of things about the recent performance of value. Um, and you know, as, as always, investors can decide how much of uh, an allocation they want to make to that. There's going to be tracking error for value investing relative to just your standard market portfolio. Um, so if you don't want a lot of tracking error, you know, have less exposure. Uh, so let's move on to the third paper we're going to talk about equity compensation planning in a TCGA world. Uh, this is a guest post by Robinson Crawford. And this is a neat article uh, just discussing, and I think this is a good article for anyone who happens to be employed uh, by an employer who's giving you some sort of equity compensation or ownership in the firm. Um, and an overview is just kind of, going through what all the different stock grants and options are. Um, so there's definitions in there and then some overall advice. Uh, so I'd recommend you read this article if you are in the, uh, I guess, fortunate instance where your employer is giving you equity compensation. So that's all we have for this week. Uh, thanks for tuning in and see you next week. The views expressed in this recording are the personal views of the participants as of the date indicated and do not necessarily reflect the views of Alpha Architect itself. Nothing contained in this recording constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice and should not be viewed as a current or past recommendation or a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or to adopt any investment strategy. The information in this recording is based on current market conditions which will fluctuate and may be superseded by subsequent market events or for other reasons. Alpha Architect does not resume any duty to update forward-looking statements. The information in this recording has been developed internally and or obtained from sources believed to be reliable. However, no representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made or given by or on behalf of Alpha Architect as to the accuracy and completeness or fairness of the information contained in this recording. Any liability as a result of this recording, including direct, indirect, special, or consequential loss or damage is expressly disclaimed. Copyright 2018, Alpha Architect LLC, all rights reserved.